Blog Talk Radio. You're listening to Talent Culture's T Chat Radio. The world of work is live now on the radio with Megan M. Biro and Kevin W. Grossman because middle initials count. Come down, turn the radio on. Welcome everybody out there in Talent Culture Tea Chat Show Land. It is Wednesday. It is April twenty second. But what time is it? It is not seven PM Eastern. It is now one PM Eastern, ten AM Pacific time. It's our new Tea Chat time and channel with you as always is Kevin W. Grossman here in Santa Cruz, California, and as always, the lovely and talented Megan M. Bureau. Hi, Megan. What time is it? That's all I have to say, everybody. Exactly, it's right? Good afternoon. <laughs> I'm here in Cambridge today. No travels. My next my next set of travels is going to be coming to you guys live in Cork, Ireland. Shout out to all my friends out there in the IT Euro tech cluster. Kevin and I will be flying out to see you guys real soon. So we'll be sharing some updates with everybody here on the on the interwebs about uh our special live tea chat that's going to be happening there in Ireland in just – what's our date for that, by the way, Kevin? That's it. That is going to be May 6th. May, May 6th. 6th, everybody. Yes. So get that on your calendars. We're stoked. I've actually yes. never been to Ireland, so this is like my very first trip there. It's going to be super sweet. I so, know. You know. I know. I know. So, yeah, this feels kind of funny, but, I mean, I'm, I'm mainlining a little caffeine right now. I'm on a new new wavelength, new beginnings here for talent culture. We've got lots more upside, uh, uh, exciting updates for everybody uh, in the coming weeks. Oh, my gosh. I mean, if, if anyone's tuning into our, our blog, the blogging community called talentculture.com, be on the lookout because we've got a sexy new WordPress theme coming your way. Okay? You that That's indeed. Just, Put your seatbelts on, everybody, in case, all right? Um, so, listen, you know, I kind of want to just dive right in, and I want to I take a moment to just give a special thank you to our lovely and talented sponsors, Dice, Jive, TalentWise, Hootsuite, IBM, CareerBuilder, PeoplesFluent, JobSite. Shout out to our friends who put on the Predictive Analytics World for Workforce Conference, and our social analytics partner out there in Cali, HR Marketer Insight. We also want to give a special shout-out to our friends over at the Candidate Experience Awards. Kevin and I are both uh, volunteer ambassadors over there and really proud to be part of that and really excited to be sharing more insights from all that research that's going on over there right now. So in, in fact, was, here and exactly. Here, real um, quick though, I, I want to hold on. I want to want to say something real quick about the candies. Like so, later today, yeah, I'm it. gonna be I'm gonna be at a Candidate Experience Workshop 101. They've been doing these regional events where they're getting practitioners in a room and they're talking shop and doing some fun exercises and really talking about talent acquisition strategy. So they've been doing them all over the place. Uh, today's is gonna be in San Francisco from one to five um, at the at San Francisco Green Space. I'm, on mission, I believe. Anyway, and then right after that, which will be fun, is that we're having a people fluent happy hours for anybody in the area, and that's oh, nice. at Chaya. Chaya, which is a really cool, which I never would have been being being the big foodie that I'm not, even though I like to eat. Uh, it's it's like a French Japanese hybrid cuisine. French there you go. Japanese. Okay, I've heard it all. That's, uh, that's there you that's, go. That's officially a new hybrid, and I'm a foodie by the way. <laughs> that's there new to me, so that's good news. All right. Um, well, have fun, and I'm I'm assuming since you're there that in people who are sponsoring it that there's going to be plenty of cheap Chardonnay. Is that correct? There'll be well, there'll That's be good Chardonnay. That you just, like? just the cheap stuff for me. Everything else okay. will be good. Just the cheap Everything stuff for else me. Everything good. Yeah. There okay. you go. I'm not touching that, by the way. I don't I don't drink cheap <laughs> Chardonnay just so the world knows. Just don't. I, Kevin and I have very different tastes when it comes to wine, but we're still friends after all these years. Well, right? but that's right? that's just an hey. I do actually no, I really do like really good Chardonnay, but that's kind of the fun joke that 
<laughs> it's the chief staff it's the candy awards and jerry chris but anyway let's okay. let's talk about the show what are we going to do what are we going to do all right so last week i mean i don't think we i mean last week was super high energy with the one and only ted rubin we were talking about how to look people in the eye digitally and today we're talking about how to turn horrible bosses into happier relationships for everybody you know today we're kind of faced in this very complex landscape right that we've never really seen before in the world of work. Regardless, I think of job growth and, you know, unemployment plummeting, wages are still pretty flat, and employers and workers are under a great deal of strain to kind of produce and and show up. And, you know, that beast of business that we all talk about keeps asking us to do more with less. Unfortunately, a bad boss can undermine your ability to get your stuff done. You know what I'm saying? Efficiently, effectively, Poor communication skills, lack of direction, micromanaging, and bullying, which is something I absolutely despise, and I'll get into that a little bit more later. Any of these traits can make a boss difficult to work with. Working for a tyrant boss is just sucky, okay? So when you have to work for difficult and demanding people every day, that stress, that frustration, that anger can totally wipe the life out of you. So... I'm really excited to talk about some techniques today for reinventing relationships with your boss. And, heck, you know, I think it's with your colleagues, with, you know, your your family. I mean, it's just, I mean, just how to not be a sucky person is what we're talking about today, okay? And how to turn um, horrible into happy. So if you're listening today, and we hope you are, tune on in. Um, And we've got the Twitters going on right now with T-Chat. Come be part of it. Thanks for being here. Yeah, exactly. And again, just really excited about our new time going forward. Um, we want to welcome today Tony DeBlau. He is the founder of consulting firm HR for Change. And for over a decade, Tony's worked with Silicon Valley companies in a various roles related to building people strategies. He's also an award-winning author and mobile app developer. He has been quoted in several media sources, including Career Builder Monster and CBS Money Watch. Welcome, Tony, to our new Time and Tea Chat show. Thanks, Kevin. Hey, Megan, how's it going? Good. It's going. So it's glad going. you're here with us today. Yes. It's um, it's an overcast day in Silicon Valley, which is unusual. But, um, you know, I guess we're, we're, we're getting, used, get, getting used to that. Uh, Kevin, you know about that. It's probably gray and overcast where you are, well, too. Well, yeah, we're getting it's tons of high fog. At least there's some moisture in the air, Tony, because that's about all the, the rain we're going to be getting of, of late. So <laughs> if, there's, if there's something that's soaking into the ground in the plants, so we can just be thankful about that, right? Why don't you, Tony, why don't you tell us um, first a little bit about more about yourself and what led you to talk about this topic we're talking about today? Sure, absolutely. So, um, you know, my background is, you know, I've had, you know, over a decade of experience um, working in human resources, organizational leadership development, uh, primarily in high-tech companies um, in Silicon Valley. And that's run the gamut from startup to mid-size, large companies. Um, and so I've been able to be exposed to quite a lot of different environments and, uh, you know, a lot of different organizational dynamics and behaviors. And so one of the main things that I've obviously worked on is employee relations, coaching leaders, those kinds of things. And so over that period of time, I've observed quite a few things. I've, you know, tried to apply at a lot of different models and uh, best practices and so forth. And so, you know, when we talk about employee engagement and how, uh, always in the top three, top five, it's always the relationship with the manager. And, you know, I leave a manager, I don't leave a company, and that whole thing. I spent a little bit more time looking at, okay, well, you know, what's the reality of of that, right? You know, there's, uh, you know, what, what, what really happens in the trenches, so to speak, when you're trying to deal with, um, let's call it an ineffective relationship with, you know, your superior. And so I spent you know, some time trying some things, you know, this is all um, real life experiences uh, to try to see what are the kinds of things that could work, especially in situations where um, it's not so simple to just say, I'm going to leave or I'm going to quit, you know, sort of like the, the normal advice people tell you to do, you know, life's too short, you know, don't stick around and all that stuff. It's like, well, what, what happens if you can't? Or, you know, what happens if, you know, you, you, you're jumping too fast and, and, and maybe there was an alternative? So, 
that's what I really kind of coalesced into some of my practices, certainly around um, coaching, but also what led to the base of the book uh, Tangling with Tyrants. Oh, Excellent. Sweet. When did that book come out? It came out a few years ago, and, um, you know, since then I was really surprised. I mean, it's really a humbling experience, you know, when you get emails and, and actually letters from people talking about, well, this really helped me. It's a different spin. It's not just, you know, the – I mean, right. the bully boss is obviously the thing that makes the media, but, you know, right. bosses right. behaving badly or what I consider a tyrant can be – um, passive aggressive behaviors too. So it's been it was really well received, um, and you know I've been able to see how it's helped a lot of people at least reframe or just rethink a little bit how they're going to approach an otherwise what seems to be an otherwise uh, unsolvable situation. So just tell us like your top three takeaways. Obviously, not everybody is an overtly bad boss or you know sucky as I like to say, right? Um, forgive, I have a trucker mouth today, I'm so sorry, um, but how do you determine what specifically your challenges are here? Like, how do you, when we talk about those kind of diffuse behaviors you're talking about, right, those the ones that aren't so obvious, and are there any signs that you haven't really exactly. had thought? Yeah. So, um, so to be so, so to be honest, I'll tell you that a lot of the, at least the use cases or, 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 or um, the stories that I've been involved with, are are subtle. They creep up on you. So, for example, uh, a new boss has joined a team, and it takes a few months for them to kind of work their way around. Or somebody's transitioned between divisions or recently promoted. Um, you know, these are things that I've noticed are uh, what sort of lead, sort of appear. So, when we look at how work behavior often invites this kind of behavior into the workplace. A lot of times it's companies that are going through transition or there's some other kind of crisis and they need that that person who, I guess, uh, leads with the stick and not the carrot, right, and and, and really wants to clean things up, drive things, and it's clearly there's got to be people and process problems and we need somebody who's going to be more in that strong, almost dictatorial stance to come and, and make it happen. So, a lot of times um, these events happen somewhat subtly and the eyes kind of turn to this more controlling um, person or personality that has had success in turning things around or, or, or making change and so forth. So that's where I've seen most of it. But signs, you know, tend to be so regardless of how this is happening suddenly over time or whatever, it's true. You're always looking for patterns. Like everything else, and I tell, I tell people in HR, you know, what gets people into trouble is the patterns of things that happen that then turn into a, you know, major problem like harassment and, and so forth. Right, um, right, that never really get brought to the surface, right? Right, exactly, because people have different levels of what they're willing to bear, right? So, so, you know, I I, I look at it as people who – tend to be more along the sort of I should worry red flags coming up is a lot of not seeking to understand or seeking to listen. So if I'm, if I'm a new boss in an environment, in a team environment, where I don't know what's going on, I'm trying to you know, figure out what's happening, there's a choice and there's something I would look for is if the person's coming in and saying, here's what I'm going to do, right? We're going to do this, we need to do this, we need to do that. Do this, right? They're not even stopping to say, well, oh, hold on. What have you, you know, talk to me about your background. What have you had? What are your challenges, right? That's more collaborative leader, whereas somebody wants to come in and just start to immediately dictate, oh, clearly I know what's wrong, right? So we're going to go do this. A lot of I statements, I will. And, you know, so that's, to me, that's the first, that's the first dead giveaway, right? That this person's probably going to be less willing to, have that partnership to fix a problem and more I am the cowboy, I am the knight on the horse riding in and I'm going to save the day and be the hero. But Tony, um, t- 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 Tony but let me, how, you're, you're talking about a lot of how do I, the, of the different patterns and behaviors to look for, but how should one go about that's in, immersed in this? How should they go about documenting this, right? Because that's really, you, you do need to do some level of that, especially to prevent an escalation that, that may occur down the road, right? So, and how do you do that in yeah. a way that that protects yourself as well as the organization? 
Yeah, I think let's start with the individual level. Yeah. Because again, again, to me, it's you know certainly as an HR person, it it's fairly simplistic, you know, document. But see, see, these some because these things kind of sneak up on you. There's this realization that I have a problem. Right there's this realization that I've seen a a series of behaviors the way I've been treated that's making me recognize this person is probably you know again somebody that's going to be either a bully or a you know um, tyrant or you know somebody that's going to make my job and my you know experience at work a problem. I think that um, you know before you jump to documentation of of these behaviors, you have to take this step back and take a look at it like. What exactly am I seeing that's happening that's harmful to me, that's impeding my, you know, emotional well-being, my productivity, you know, these kinds of things? Because if you don't have a focus on what exactly is being impacted by the behavior you're being exposed to, then it's really difficult to have the proper documentation, right? Because documentation mm-hmm. should be around these are specific things that is happening between us or that you're doing that is creating a business impact to me, i.e., I can't get this project done, I don't have the right information, you know, you're, you're focusing on the wrong things, we're, we're going in the wrong direction. So the documentation has to back up an actual business impact because it's not that companies, generally speaking, don't care how you feel. And, again, I am someone who doesn't believe that you can, you know, use the legal system to manage a jerk, Okay. Um, it's more a just, jerk. yeah, because a lot of people, you know, in HR, as soon as they have a problem, they run to HR, oh, you got to fire this guy, oh, you got to do this guy. It's like, well, well, hold on a second, okay, in business, you may be having this issue, but what is it impacting, you know, business-wise? I care about your emotional thing. That's a whole engagement and retention thing on its own. But the documentation that matters, the documentation that will get people, not just in HR, but up the chain to pay attention is that as a result of this behavior, these things aren't happening with myself, with the team, and so forth. So that's how I would just sort of characterize the documentation. It has to be specific things that are leading to specific business impacts for it to have any real weight. Right. And then, of course, you layer it with the emotional stuff, right, because it becomes a retention thing. But it starts with the business impact. It's not what happened with uh, just real quick, and then we move to other related topics. But with one of the Kevin, Kevin, uh, you're breaking up. You're breaking uh, up. <laughs> uh, oh, so, so here, so, so the case of Philip Kelly really without how lines um, so just hey Kevin, we can't quite hear you. You're kind of coming in and out. So I'm going to hop on in here for you and ask the question that I think is probably on a lot of people's mind right now. When is quitting an option for employees? And like, what what do you recommend to people when they're like, I just I just can't deal anymore. This boss is just horrific. Like, what what do you right. do? You know? Yeah, and and again, I I can tell you, I've seen all all shades of that, right? I've seen how that behavior can lead to burnout, to work to pr- workplace depression, which are two very distinct things, by the way. Um, can you tell us just how they distinct? Because that, that's, yeah, so, that's an interesting nuance. Yeah, so so burnout tends to be the behavior you see around burnout is that they blame everybody else. Oh, it's the manager. They don't know this. Oh, the company doesn't know what they're doing. Oh, my team sucks. That's more I've come to the edge of I'm overwhelmed with my job, and I'm trying to find blame as to why this is, this is occurring. Workplace depression tends to show behavior that is more um, – I'm just not good enough for this anymore. You know, it doesn't it doesn't really matter what I'm doing. It doesn't. It, it's more that internal reflective. I, I'm taking it all, and I don't feel worthy, and I don't feel whatever. So, the nonverbals that go with that, you know, John, burnout tends to be more animated because it's it's outward to others, and then the depression is more inward, and you tend to see people more unwilling to speak, shying away, a lot of absenteeism. You know, so that's where I kind of look at, you know you know, the both sides. And I've seen, like I said, I've seen one single bad leader, bad boss drive different people down those paths. And, um, you know, it, it, it's funny when we talk about um, how do we deal with that, right, and when quitting isn't an option. Because um, it's not for so it, many people. I mean, I think that's an honest take. No, no. Right. It, it, it is. It's true. Um 
you know, in, in most of the cases that I've had, there's a variety of reasons what drives that. Um, interestingly, in Silicon Valley, a lot of times it's, their, it's tied to their visa. They're tied to the company. Right. 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 So they can't leave. Right. So they, they're, they're stuck. Or things like they have a 401k loan. That's a huge loan. They can't leave because they have to pay it back if they leave the company. So you can go through a litany of reasons why it's not just, oh, I have a bad boss, I have to leave, right? right? And I think that, you know, what I try to talk about certainly in my coaching and I talk about in the book is getting back to this idea of, you know, if you put the emotion aside for a second, yes, nobody should be treated this way. If somebody's bullying you, or again, I think passive aggressive is actually worse because those are behaviors that tend to be, um, you know, they have conversations behind your back about how you're not a good performer, and then they smile nicely to your face, or, you know, innuendo it's comments so like that. Uh, that is just such a deal breaker for culture. No, absolutely. And uh, so, hey, it's, it's back, back. Can you hear me? Can you? Hear me? We can kind of hear you, but you're just barely. You're still choppy. You're still a little choppy. So, up so, here, so, much, for the, so much for the Skype. Picture. Okay, so there you go. <laughs> um, you hear now? No, you're kind of you're in and out, my friend. You know, let's, we, we can keep Negative trying though. On the show. Yeah, there there you go. I think I think it's time. Yeah. So you know, obviously everybody comes to a place, and and I know I've had my own set of horrible bosses when I wasn't self-employed, right? Um, who hasn't probably, and everybody's version of what a horrible boss is is so probably varies quite a bit, bit if we actually did some data around it. But right. what, what's going on in your world with your career, Tony? I mean, have you had a, a horrible boss before? And oh, yes. If so, did that lead you to kind of what you've been focusing on in your consulting practice? Tell us just a little bit more on, on the personal yeah. side of Tony. Yeah, absolutely. So when I was starting, you know, when I started, I, mean, I was one of those, I fell into HR, which, you know, I'm sure a lot of people in your audience will have similar stories. They didn't start in HR, they fell into HR. I, and, um, I hear that, yep. Yeah, so I, I fell into HR by way of recruiting. And, yeah, um, I was, I was when, I, when I was still an active practitioner, um, and, you know, I, I've moved away from that, I was, I was a recruiter as well. That's kind of where I, where I started in this whole talent management space, so. And, and yeah. those were when we were still actually saying HR and recruiting are the same under the same umbrella, and now there's like you know nine flavors. Oh, of oh they're the anyway, same. Yeah, yeah. That 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 can be a whole another talent show, a talent culture show. That's because, a whole uh, exactly. You know, this whole idea that uh, we need to distinguish recruiting is like, guys, it's still HR, okay? It's a specialization I, with HR. Let's leave it at that. So, um, I, but yeah, yeah, so I had totally. a bad experience. I was doing recruiting. I was a generalist, and. Um, I had my first big opportunity with VP, global division, you know, big deal, and I was all excited, and I did all my pre-work. I did their org charts. I looked at their comp, I, and I wanted to really make a first, good first impression because one of my early jobs in HR. And I'll never forget the scene. I walked in, and it's so classic, right? Big desk, big, you know, mahogany desk, big high back chair, and this guy, you know, um, sitting was on the phone. We had a scheduled appointment, you know, I have a whole thing. And I walked in the door. He didn't get off the phone. He just kind of looked at me and pointed to a chair that was in front of this big desk. Oh, my so, God. No problem. Yeah, no problem. I came in. Yeah, I sat down. I was all ready to go. And, you know, he's still on the phone as I'm sitting oh, no. down. And then I hear, he's like, yeah, I'll meet you at four or, or I'll meet you at three and we'll, you know, we'll tee off. And we'll do it. So it was a personal call. Okay. So, okay, fine. Uh, that was, that actually lasted another uh, three minutes that he was doing this personal call. So fine. Afterwards. So he hung up the phone, didn't shake it, didn't get so high, you know, welcome, whatever. He folded his hands and he looked at me and he said, I just want you to know, that um, I make the decisions around here. I decide oh, who I no. hire, who I fire, and what goes on. And nobody from HR is going to tell me what to do otherwise. Nice. And that was that was how he introduced himself. We, wow. so, like, I know. Really so a, a great opportunity for me to to really shine. Yeah, absolutely. So here I was all prepared, and again, he wasn't my he was my sort of my dotted line manager. So I mean, I was still reporting to HR, but basically he could influence my performance review, my bonus plan, everything else, because that's how this company was structured. And so 
I, I, I sat there dumbfounded, and, 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 and so I started to kind of open my mouth and try to recover from the situation, and his phone rang. And he picked it up, and he started, you know, talking like, yeah, yeah, okay. He turned to me, and he basically said, you know, kind of pointed at the phone and then waved. That was the end of the meeting. <laughs> he pointed at the phone and waved? Yeah. <laughs> Are you serious? Is this just yeah. sounds like a movie script, seriously. Wow. Like, this is just too horrific. You should write yeah. that out. Like, that's just ridiculous. You, that's ridiculous. Oh, yeah. That no, I talk, I talk about that in the book because, you know, as I was walking out the door, you could imagine so many things were crashing in my head. Did I pick the right profession? Did you know why did I choose to work here? So all these things were happening to me, and I definitely think that that gave me a base into the work that I did, you know, since then, you know, and right. trying to understand when somebody comes to me who's clearly in pain, not just angry, but in pain, hopeless, right, feeling like. I don't know what else to do. I, 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 you know, like I said, it, it really helped solidify that emotional compassion connection to say, yeah, I am not just this, you know, whatever view you have of HR, and people have all these different views, right? I've, I'm not an administrative HR guy. I've always come from the business side. So for me, I've always taken, well, what does it mean to have somebody emotionally crippled working in, under this roof, Clearly not everything's getting done. Clearly this person's not being leveraged. So I'm looking at all of these sort of, you know, organizational impacts of one key but one relationship. And how much is this person creating that problem? So, so Megan, going back to that whole subjective thing, I agree. One person's tyrant is not another person's tyrant. I think, I think we know right. that. Um, but I think it is safe to say that there are certain behaviors that, you know, if you read all the research or you look at all the models and the case studies and things that are out there, there tends to be a pretty good set of data around when leaders, you know, seek to understand, leverage the strengths of people, provide, you know, um, balanced feedback and so forth. These aren't just myths, pie in the sky things. It is a, it's a set of behaviors that go into motion that let people feel like I'm enabled to add value. And that's one of the biggest things of what drive people to leave companies is that sense of, am I adding value? Am I doing something that makes me feel like I'm contributing well? So if you have behaviors that are counter to that, that make you feel incompetent or that make you feel, well, it doesn't matter what you do or um, everything you do is wrong or whatever, you're going to take a fundamental part of what makes organizations function and throw it out the door. So it's hey, no I wonder. Think, I, yeah. yeah. I think what yeah, tyrant that, bosses do best is instill a sense of learned hopelessness in their employees. Oh, oh very much. Very you much know, so. I mean, it's like, and, and that's exactly that scenario you did. And, and, and I see this unfolding still today. It's still, it's still a trend around culture topics and workplace topics, obviously. Yeah. There's a lot of so pirates out there. You know? Hey, we're down. Hey, we're down. Sorry, folks. We're down to um, the Gremlin Skype experiment gone awry. I'm back again, but we're down to a minute and a half. So, so listen. Welcome um, back. Tony, yeah, Tony, it was a fantastic discussion today. Real quick, um, uh, something to think about. I know we're not going to have time to really dive into it, but I'm just curious if you got 30 seconds on how gender diversity impacts a lot of what we've been talking about today. There's been a lot of a lot of write-up, especially a focus on Silicon Valley disparity in that regard. So do you have any quick comments about that? Yeah. Um, I think it's safe to say that uh, there's a, there, there are probably good, you know, you know, case studies out there that some of these, um, you know, classic tyrant behaviors tend to be more with guys, more with males, more of that male dominance thing, and it's more of an impact, um, you know, uh, with women, and, and and part of that is because you have in many companies, as we saw with reports that came out recently of sort of big companies and their diversity numbers, that um, you know women there's there's not a big representation to begin with, so you right. already have a fairly male dominated org structure, and so that if you add on top of that these you know behaviors floating around, I think that you probably see that impact on how women perceive you know, how that relationship is, how they can fix the relationship, what it means to their promotion opportunities and so forth, and it does with, with men. Now, that said, 
there is a small group of research that's starting to emerge about women oriented tyrants and you know do they do they show similar behaviors do they do they enact ways you know in, in similar ways because they obviously they exist but oh, i think that there's absolutely. fewer of them yeah. and um the yeah. only other one point i would i want to add to sort of the, either the gender and just the topic in general about you know when do i know i've kind of absolutely come to a person where you know, I'm 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 trying to address it. I feel like I've looked myself in the mirror. I'm doing the right things. I'm business focused and all these other things in terms of my conversation with this person. I would say about five percent of this, what you want to call sort of generic population of you know bad bosses, bullies, tyrants, whatever, are true sociopaths. And if you get wow. into a sociopath, right, like a Dexter level sociopath, we could do a whole, whole other show about that, honey. Yeah. Show um, about that. <laughs> Those are ones where you're you're, you're going to hit a dead end no matter what you do. I mean, it's it's, it's right, a right. whole different ball game. Well, we're out of time. We ran we already ran out, but I, I didn't want to finish stop you because I loved how we ended that. But now we got to jump to the Twitter chat. So, are you ready to go, Tony, to come fire up with the the community on Twitter? Oh yes, I've been seeing it coming through already. Nice. Absolutely. Well, thanks so, so much jump. for being here, Tony. We we appreciate yeah. it and. You're definitely um, somebody I'm excited to meet in person one of these days. So Absolutely. Thanks, everybody, for All right. tuning in. Talk to you later. Thanks. Okay. Thank Twitter you. chat time. What's going on? <laughs>